Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and welcome to Pluto and its partner Sharon. In today's video we're going to be talking about one of the mysteries of the solar system that has recently been officially kind of explained away by the Japanese scientists who did some really thorough analysis and wrote a really good paper that you can find in the description below. Let's talk about why is it that most smaller objects in our solar system have very unique and very specific moons. And welcome to What The Math. So you might know by now that uh, Pluto has um, different moons, but one of the bigger partners that it has is right there. This is Charon. Charon is, um, in terms of the actual mass and size, comparable to Pluto in a sense. It's roughly around 10 times less massive than Pluto. But the way that it was formed a long time ago has been a mystery. The Japanese scientist who wrote the paper with the title that you see on the screen um, and published it in Nature magazine have actually tried to understand and simulate what exactly happened to Pluto that may have resulted in what you see right here. A slightly better simulation that shows it a little bit better is here in Universe Sandbox where you can even see that both objects are tidally locked to each other, they're always facing each other, and they also influence each other's orbits. So you can kind of see how Pluto is actually moving around Charon as Charon moves around Pluto. But this is not a unique situation. As a matter of fact, something similar happens around a lot of similar objects known as TNO or trans-Neptunian objects because they're located past the orbit of Neptune. So here if we look at the list we'll discover at least six more objects that have moons that are somewhat difficult to explain and behave in a very similar fashion to Pluto. Now Sharon and Pluto have sort of like the biggest mass ratio with um, this being 1 to 10 masses and the smallest mass ratio here is roughly around 1 to 1000. But nevertheless, it is interesting how all of these objects, like Quar, Haumea, uh, Makemake, and Eris, have moons with very similar behavior and orbital parameters to Pluto and Charon. But also, very similar to another object that we're all familiar with, our planet Earth and our moon. And so, this is where the mystery begins to kind of be unfolded and in a sense resolved. The Japanese scientists made an assumption and it paid off. They made an assumption that the way that all of these moons were made was in the same way that our moon was made in relation to Earth. And the creation story here involves an object similar to Mars in mass and size that collided with Earth, creating the moon-Earth binary system that we know today. Uh, now, I've actually simulated this several times using the Universe Sandbox. There are a few videos you can watch above my head that show this in a little bit more detail. So the idea here is that it's very likely that this is how those objects were created as well, but the simulations had to be very specific and very detailed in order to establish if this hypothesis was correct. Now to try to understand if this is right or not, there were three major simulations the Japanese scientists ran. One of the simulations involved the Pluto, Eris, um, Makemake and other objects as they are today, basically hard, rigid and solid objects that may have collided with other solid objects, just like you see right here. And um, the result for this particular simulation was that it didn't really produce the observations that we have. It didn't have the exact orbital parameters, the eccentricities were all off and so on and so forth. They then tried to recreate these simulations, assuming that these objects were actually hot and molten for the first million years of their lifetime, and uh, tried to reproduce these collisions again, just to discover that with these molten objects, uh, once again, the produced orbital parameters, the uh, eccentricity and so on, was not really what we observed in reality. And then there was another simulation here where the um, bodies behaved as if they were fluid for only for the first thousand years. In other words, they were molten at first, but then cooled down relatively quick and received some sort of a collision from another object. And in that case, the observations were almost directly spot on. And so these observations made them realize that it's very likely that all of these objects were relatively hot and molten in the beginning, received some sort of a collision from a nearby object, and this collision eventually produced the satellites, the moons that we see today. The heat itself can be explained quite easily by the presence 
of various isotopes, for example, um, aluminium-26, which is a relatively short-lived isotope that can produce enough heat on the inside to turn these objects molten for a little bit, for a few um, thousands, possibly a million years. And during that time, they would receive the collision that would then create the moon. And so the important observation here is that, well, these objects had to be molten, but not for very long. And the collision had to have occurred early on in the creation of the solar system. So it's very likely that um, all of these moons that we used saw previously had to have been created in the first 700 million years of the solar system um, and not afterwards. There's almost no way for us to explain the existence of these moons and their orbital parameters if they were created after the initial phase when these objects were still hot and had very molten surfaces. It's also very likely that all of these objects already had their moons when Earth and the Moon were still developing, and it's also very likely that the beautiful surface of Pluto here, along with other objects, is probably some of the most ancient surfaces in the solar system. So by going here and by studying these surfaces, we can discover some really interesting mysteries of the ancient solar system. The other very interesting discovery here is that it seems that these large objects, like Pluto, basically got created relatively fast. Within the first few million years, these large planetesimals already existed and were colliding with each other and creating other larger objects. So this is, in a sense, a sort of a proof and um, evidence that the solar system may have been created from these objects as we originally suspected. And all of this, of course, suggests that the satellites of these large trans-Neptunian objects like Pluto and Makemake were formed via giant impacts way before the migration of planets like Neptune, and it's very likely that they were basically this. They were partially molten during the giant impact era, and at the same time only stayed molten um, for a relatively short period of time. They cooled down pretty quickly, the orbits of their satellites and moons stabilized, and the entire system became relatively stable for the next few billion years. And because these objects like Pluto, Ares, and Makemake were created relatively at the same time as the solar system was still de developing and was still growing, understanding the origin of these moons and understanding what's really happening with these particular objects is important in us learning what happened in the early solar system. So in some sense, these are relics of the past. These are literally some of the first objects that formed in the early solar system and most likely will explain to us how all of the solar system developed afterwards. But nevertheless, even without these speculations or without potential explanations for the solar system, just the fact that we now understand how the moons of these objects were created and how it relates to the creation of our own moon is sort of important. It definitely explains to us how many of these objects do get to these large moons that have very specific orbits and actually relates to another study that explained that when the object known as Theia collided with the planet Earth that resulted in the creation of the Moon may also have occurred in the period of time when Earth was still molten. At least one paper explains it really well and explains how then the Moon proceeded to be developed the way that we know it today. So all of this connects together, all of this explains how these moons are created and in some sense all of this confirms that our understanding of the creation of the solar system for the most part, is sort of correct. In other words, in order for us to have these beautiful moons that may also kind of protect the planet itself, you need to have a relatively large collision early on in the creation of the solar system. Without this particular collision, our moon would not have existed, these moons would also not be possible, and none of this would look anywhere similar to what we have right now. So this is a brilliant study that explains the creation of moons, very large moons, that might be something we need to start looking for around other stars and around other exoplanets. Because by finding such large moons, we might also find a planet that's suitable for life or maybe even habitable. But before we go into that, that's really all I wanted to mention in this particular video. Check out the study in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't and share this video with someone who enjoys learning about space and sciences and wants to know more about the universe in general. I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot. Space out and as always, bye bye.